Dear Adam, your birthday is on April 1st, and you would have turned 36 years old. I'm sure if you were still here, your family and all your friends would have thrown you a party and teased you about becoming an old man. I know this because I met your mom and sister a year after you died, a year after you saved my life. Most people do not look forward to getting old, but not Cheryl Olson, who recently turned 45 and truly believes that every day of life is a gift and should not be taken for granted. Until you've gone through something like this, I think it's very easy to take being healthy um, for granted, just to take your day-to-day -day life for granted. I, I was just a normal person. I, I didn't do anything. I just got a cold and my life changed drastically. I was suddenly fighting for my life. And every day you have things that happen in your life that, that are special moments. Just something, just hugging your child or kissing your husband goodbye as he goes out the door to work. These are things that should never be taken for granted because they can be gone so quickly. She never thought that her visit to Portland, Oregon in 1999 would totally change her life. She was just 31 years old at the time. And while I was there, I, um, I became even more sick. Um, it became obvious that something was very seriously wrong. Um, I was talking with my brother one day and really in the blink of an eye, I just felt like I was going to be sick. And I ended up in bed for a few days, um, again thinking it was a bad flu until I just could hardly breathe anymore and uh, my parents took me to a, um, a critical care unit there in Oregon and uh, they ran some tests on me. Um, I think I scared one of them quite badly when I passed out while they were trying to take an x-ray but they, um, they couldn't even get a blood pressure reading on me then and um, I uh, ended up having triple pneumonia in both of my lungs and I was uh, admitted to a hospital down there for a couple of weeks. In the days to follow, Cheryl found that she had contracted a virus which attacked her heart, putting her life in grave danger. It was to be the beginning of an incredible journey for her, her family, many close friends and church members around the world as she battled for life, waiting for a heart transplant. I don't think I ever thought I was in serious danger. Um, there were scary moments, um, struggling to breathe, the thought of open heart surgery, um, the thought that I might have leukemia, but I, I don't think I ever thought that I, my life was in danger. I thought we might have a struggle ahead of us, um, but I wasn't afraid in that way. So I had, I had a really good support system with my family, my husband, my, my parents, and my brothers, and and all of our friends and um, our church family, everybody was praying me through it. So I think that had a lot to do with the fact that I didn't become overwhelmed with everything. If this were any other surgery, the emotional battle would not have been so profound. But because it was a vital organ transplant, the chance this battle would be won was very low. Well, you don't exactly know what to expect. You, you always try to stay positive. I was trying to stay positive for, for Cheryl. I was trying to stay positive for my kids, trying to stay positive for my family. And the whole time in, inside, you know, you're, it feels like there's a, a storm going on. Um, you feel a little bit, um, as a man, you wish that there was something that you could do. Some, you could bring a, a solution to, to help because you feel responsible. But at the same time, you felt very helpless that you would, you were going down a journey that you you didn't know what was ahead of you. A mother of two young children, 
Lindsay six years, and Eric three, Cheryl began the fight against time and her own body. That day I was admitted to the hospital and my husband was told that I was very sick and that not many people in my situation survive. And that was of course a very shocking thing for him to hear. Um, he had to call my parents back. Um, they had already left and they returned to help take care of the kids. And um, I was admitted to the hospital there. And uh, I was in the cardiac care unit during that time. And I really wasn't, um, I wasn't very with it. I wasn't eating very much. Um, I was sleeping a lot, of course, because my heart wasn't functioning. I wasn't getting oxygen that I needed. I was, I was very tired. It was a race against the clock. Without a heart donor, doctors gave her only hours to live. But during that time, they actually started talking about the possibility of a, of a transplant. I was too sick to really know that was happening. Um, I don't remember hearing them talk about it. They were telling me that they were going to send me to Edmonton. And when a bed became available, um, I was uh, flown out there on a medical plane with my husband. And it was really a difficult, very difficult day. My daughter had just started grade one and um, my husband was told it was time for me to go and he went to the school and picked her up and brought her um, uh, brought her to the hospital. It was difficult to, to pray because it, it felt selfish. You know, I want you, Lord, to, to save my wife, you know, for me. But you, uh, you had to rely heavily on the prayers of others who, who weren't going to benefit personally from the experience, but collectively you know, we could come together and, and we could petition God on, on behalf of others, you know. And that was very, very important in this journey. At the suggestion of a close friend, the family went to the media for help in a desperate attempt to increase Cheryl's chances to find a new heart. Um, in, when I was in Mississauga, feeling so far away and so helpless, um, it was in a, another family who a few years prior were going through the same experience with their little girl and they went to the media and the awareness um, helped and so that's when I called them asking if they had thought about it. In the game against time, Cheryl had few moves left. I thought in my own quiet time, sure, that, that was a possibility. And yet, I didn't want to dwell on it. I wanted to keep my, I wanted to keep thinking positively, not naively, um, as though I didn't realize that they could have a, uh, a poor outcome, but, but just trusting that no matter what it was, that we were going through. Cheryl needed a miracle, the gift of life, but also the gift of a future, of hope, and most of all, of time. When you're in a critical situation like that, you don't have much time. Um, I ended up being 133 hours on life support, so I went way past their 48 hour window um, of opportunity. At one point, my mom said, I'm no longer on medical time, I'm, a, I'm on God's time. September 24th, 1999. It was hard for your mom to share the memories because she's still sad about you not being around. She shared with us a story of how the two of you sat at home one night watching the news. One of the top stories was of a young mom in the hospital there very sick and in desperate need of a heart transplant. Once the news item was over, you turned to her and said, 
wow, don't you wish there's something we could do to help them? I still get chills when I think of that. You had no way of knowing that within two days you would have a fatal accident that would have your family faced with making an important decision at a very difficult time. Adam Miller, a 21-year-old Edmonton man, was fatally injured after jumping from a fourth floor balcony during a police raid. Looking at her brain-dead son, hooked up to life support machines in the university hospital, Allie Miller knew something good had to come from his death. Adam Miller became the hero for Cheryl Olson. You were only 21. At 2.30 in the morning, on September 25th, 1999, the pager my husband had been wearing went off, letting him know that our prayers had been answered. Please don't take that the wrong way, Adam. Our prayers weren't that someone would die so that I could live, but rather that if by chance it was someone's time to go, that my life could be saved through organ donation. You saved five lives that day. I'm sure you understand what I mean. Adam's heart was now beating in Cheryl's chest. Under current Canadian transplant standards, typically the recipient and donor family would remain anonymous to each other. Due to an unusual set of circumstances, Cheryl met the donor's family. I want you to know that as my family gathered together to give thanks for this gift, they brought up you, your mom, and family in their prayers for God's comfort to be with them as they said goodbye to you. You became our hero. I had no idea I was getting a heart. I was so sick and on life support. The doctors were amazed I lasted so long on that machine, over 136 hours before they wheeled me into surgery. It has been 14 and a half years since that day, and I hope you have some way of knowing what your precious gift has given to me. Adam would have turned 36 years old this year. I have been able to see my son learn to ride a bike without training wheels when he was four. And I choked back tears listening to my daughter sing in a children's choir at age seven. I have been able to watch them grow taller and smarter year by year. And I have been able to hold them when they have cried. None of this would have been possible without you, Adam, and the decision to donate made by your family. Maybe someday I'll be able to say all of this and more to you face to face. But until then, this will have to do. Thank you, Adam. God bless you. It was around Christmas time of 2007, and I, um, I I had a very strange pain, chest pain, and I laid down and went away. <laughs> so I just kind of chalked it up to some silly excuse. Um, but uh, that was actually the beginning of some more problems that I was going to face within the next year. Um, I ended up having more pains that eventually took me to the emergency room a couple of times, um, and the second time, uh, they found that I had had a mild heart attack. In medical terms, Adam had a myocardial bridge interfering with one artery, creating a 70% blockage. If Adam had lived, he would have probably suffered a minor heart attack. Cheryl suffered instead. I consider this to be a, a gift from God that I had the pain because when they do a heart transplant, they actually have to cut all of the nerves around your heart. So when you have a heart attack, you probably won't feel it because all of your nerves have been cut. But in rare circumstances, the nerves will regrow. And that's what had happened in my situation. So I actually was feeling the heart attack. If I had not felt that, I would have continued going on like normal, not knowing anything was happening, and probably eventually had some kind of a major heart attack. So that was actually a blessing in disguise that I, that I felt the pain. A new battle began for her life. You know, it's, it's not easy to hear that you have to go through something like this again. It's a very big struggle. And um, it would have been very easy to just shut down 
emotionally, mentally, um, to, to cry. And, and I had my moments. I mean, I had my moments where I cried. Um, after going through those tests, when I got the phone call from um, Edmonton letting me know that I was officially on the list again, uh, I remember it was, um, my son was home that day. And I hung up the phone and I just started to cry. And he came over and sat beside me and, um, and just put his arm around me and let me cry. I think this experience has helped me realize that I, I can't, I can't be too proud. I can't be too uh, overly invested in something that I can't change. Um, I had to be a, become a humble person and not necessarily just accept my fate, but, but put my trust in God. I didn't have a choice. And, and that, that, that changed me. That, that experience helped me to understand where, where I fit into the scheme uh, of life. That I'm, I'm just playing a role here. That I'm not any better or any worse than anybody. Um, but I, I certainly uh, had to take my my, my feelings a way that uh, something that I could do other than pray would, would do anything uh, for me. Being a second transplant, the chances for a successful surgery were significantly decreased. Generally speaking, they are at higher risk for rejection because their body is already alerted to a foreign body and um, now there's a second one that may be different again, so they are um, statistically at higher risk for rejection. But they're, and, and the risk of um, having previously had surgery and scar tissue that might make the surgery more difficult, but um, they would consider all of that when they're looking at that patient as a potential candidate. There's lots of reasons why someone who's previously had a transplant might not be a good candidate for a second one. She was lucky that she was. Uh, at about 1.30 in the morning on Wednesday, October 15th, the phone rang. And this was one week after I got the call that I was on the list. And Darren grabbed the phone and he could see that it was the University of Alberta Hospital calling. And um, he handed me the phone and I answered and, and she said, we, we have a heart for you. Would you like to accept it at this time? <laughs> I felt like my head was spinning. I, I, it was so unreal. Um, I looked at Darren and I said, they have a heart. And I, I said to, to the nurse on the other line, I said, what should I do? Is it, is it a good heart? Is it a good match? And she said, they think it would be perfect for you. And so I said, yes, I'll take it. For Cheryl, it was the moment of what ifs. I had that moment with my son there that I, I talked to him um, about the what if. What if it didn't come or what if I didn't survive this? Um, but I had never had that chance with my daughter during that week. And so when we were at the airport, um, we could see the, the plane getting closer and closer in the sky. And I just remember I turned to her and I held her hands and I said, whatever happens, whatever happens, don't get mad at God. Keep your faith strong and stay close to your family.
it was important for me to know that my kids knew how much I loved them because there's no guarantee even there, even though there was a heart that I was going to survive the surgery, that my body would accept the heart. Um, so many things can go wrong after and uh, I just needed to say those things to both of my kids. At the same time, it was the perfect moment for another miracle. Dear Lindsay, I thought I was going to have Adam's heart for the rest of my life, which I hoped would be a very long life, but that wasn't to be the case. I didn't think I would ever know where this heart came from. Finding out about Adam was kind of a, a fluke, I guess. So I really wasn't expecting to know where this next precious gift was coming from. Little did I know that it was coming from you, Lindsay. During the time that I was in surgery, there was another family in the waiting room area. Um, the way they have it set up there, it's kind of different waiting rooms that are divided by walls, but no real doors on them, so you kind of walk back and forth past these rooms. And uh, the family that was at the end, closest to the, the surgical unit, uh, was the family of a, um, a beautiful 16-year-old girl. whose name happened to be Lindsay. <laughs> Just like my daughter. <sighs> and they were the family that, um, that had to uh, make that difficult decision to donate her organs after she had been uh, hurt in an accident. She, uh, the mother, came down to where my family was because she had heard someone talk about a transplant as she was walking by. And she asked them if somebody, if they were waiting for someone that was having a transplant. And my husband said, yes, my wife. And she said, well, my daughter's in being a donor. And uh, they talked for a few minutes, and, um, and we found out that her name was Lindsay, and that she was 16. And my Lindsay, my daughter Lindsay, was 15 at that time, and that was really rough on her to hear that. Um, in fact, they are almost uh, exactly a year different in age. There are two sides to every donation story the happy ending side for the family who receives the organ, and the end of a story for the family who donates. Both of my donors have been very special to us. And, um, and Lindsay right now um, is a part of me right now. And we have her picture in my living room and um, along with an angel that's holding a heart that her mom gave me. And um, we keep in touch and, and uh, every year at Christmas time, I buy a new heart ornament of some kind that we put on the tree just because Christmas has always been one of my favorite times and as a family. And it's just another way of celebrating the fact that I'm still here, that uh, I'm still able to share in you know, all of the memories, um, all of the moments, all of the wonderful things that I've been able to do with my family. In a short while, I will see my son graduate high school. These are days I didn't know if I would have. But thanks to your family, knowing the kind of person that you, that you were, they agreed to help others. They agreed to let you save the lives of others as your final act here. And I was one of those lives. And I will be eternally grateful for that. 
Thank you so much, Lindsay. God bless you. Organ donation is not an easy decision for a parent to make at the emotionally charged time of a child's death. But their selfless decisions changed Cheryl's life forever, bringing hope and making miracles. Looking back at all the things they went through, Cheryl and Darren believed that the situations made them stronger and they would never change that for anything. I don't think I would change it. I really don't. Because you, you grow in that experience. It, things that you learn that you didn't realize you needed to learn. And uh, because life isn't all just happy and joy, it, there's hard parts. And it, it's those hard parts that really help you, and uh, I'm, which I'm thankful for. I've had people ask if you could go back and not go through all of this, would you? Um, the logical answer to that is, of course, yes, I wouldn't want to go through any of this. But I, I, don't, I don't think I would change it. I, I don't think I would change it. Um, the things that I've learned to appreciate in life are, are a gift. Um, and that's something I wouldn't want to give back. With so many life-changing stories being written every day, it's impossible to remain untouched. I am inspired every day by my patients and their ability to recover from such life-threatening disease. And I, I'm motivated when I see how well they do and, and I continue to work with them in the organization to see that they're not only are they back to work and participating in the games, but they just have a, a love of life that motivates me every day. They're, they're actively volunteering in their community, they're active in, with their families, and um, just ready to try anything. Maybe most of us are unaware of the effect that organ donation can have for those fighting for a second chance at life. 200 people in Alberta alone were given a second chance at life through an organ transplant in 2013. Kidney and pancreas transplants occur most frequently with 100 recorded cases, followed by liver transplant, which account around 80 cases. The remaining transplant surgeries of vital organs were to replace the heart and lungs. Unfortunately, one in three patients will die before receiving their transplant. Certainly there are people who think that if I talk about dying, it's gonna happen. And they don't, so they don't even wanna talk about it. Or people feel that if I say that I'll donate my organs, they won't work as hard to save me if something happens to me. There's a lot of myths around dying and organ donation. Cheryl's life story is a story of hope, a story of new second chances, a story of love, faith, and hope. And hope is always what dies last. Miracles are happening every day around us. We just have to open our eyes to see and be amazed by them. It is up to us to let the miracles shine. Those are all gifts that were given to me. It's, it's life. It's everyday life that I've been able to be here for. And there's no way you can ever possibly say thank you for something like that.